and you're not going to get any like when I was on SNL when Gerard Butler was there or whatever. (laughs) There's none of that. It's going to be something else. I'm Saya Rankin from Entertainment Weekly, and I'm here with Jenny Slate, uh, author of Little Weirds, which is out in paperback now. I'm so curious how, especially like from like an insider-y books nerd perspective, like how did you pitch this book? Like what was your kind of like, how did you describe it, especially before you sat down to like really write it? Like what was your goal or kind of sell? Huh, well, that's such a good question because sort of underlying everything is this feeling that I've had that it's like all of the stuff that I really want to do, like I have the deep creative urge to do, is fairly unpitchable. It, it yeah. even if you try to say what it is, you're kind of going to murder it by by trying to condense it into a pitch. Like Marcel yeah. Shell is a really, really good example of that. How it, would you like, even? <laughs> like it doesn't, you just can't, you just have to mm-hmm. do it. And, and that's why, you know, it starts as a internet short that we make for free, right? But like what had happened, I guess, was that I, I had started just writing little pieces for myself. And, mm-hmm. um, and they were just so different than the voice that I speak in in my standup, but they weren't a contrived voice. They just mm-hmm. were like my private voice, not when I'm trying to be secretive, but just when I am, when I'm like doing my very best and my most sort of like ingenious personal work at just trying to enjoy being alive. And um, (laughs) I was like, I like this. I want to write a book like this. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I had all of these little pieces and I was like, this is just a few things, but then it turned out to be, I think, I think it was maybe like 60 pages of writing. Most did not end up in the book, Um, Mm -hmm. but I was kind of like, this is what I sound like. I'll be writing along these lines. in one way or another, this will be um, a feminist collection. At the at the out, at the outset, I thought like maybe I will write a collection of like feminist fairy tales, and not like retelling of fairy tales, but new ones um, mm-hmm. uh, coming from a place that were that was like, what if patriarchy was not the god of our culture? Mm-hmm. Um, what if it were something different? What would that, what would religion be like? What would our myths be like um, if we didn't have like a mean old daddy God? <laughs> um, what would it be like? At this point, is it, when you're like doing this pitch, is it post 2016 election by this point? Yeah, it was just yeah. post that. So, okay. so there had been in the culture, um, like Harvey Weinstein had been, um, revealed or finally, you know, finally accused in a way that actually um, created change. And Donald Trump had been elected um, even after the like grab him by the stuff that m- most people thought like, well, certainly that person then- This is the end. <laughs> like, <laughs> alone that he's not qualified, um, he- He's bad too, right? So that won't happen. Um, so there was a lot in culture that was like, hey, um, misogyny and patriarchy and like endemic sexism are really like, they are, they're like roaring. It, you know, mm-hmm. maybe it's a death rattle, but like they're really here. We can't, we can't be lazy about it. So either way, I kind of went in and was like, this is what I sound like. This is what I might write about. Um, I don't know what will come out but it will be um, a book of like meditations and expressions of feeling that have occurred to me during this time, which is like, I don't know, you know? And then there were some Mm -hmm. editors that were like, so is it like a bossy pants? And I was like, (laughs) no, I mean, I'm just capable. Not not that I don't like that book, I I do. But but I was very clear, like, you're not going to get, you're not going to get like essays about, um, like essays, first of all, mm-hmm. that seem like yeah. they're essays and totally. you're not going to get any like, when I was on SNL, when Gerard Butler was there or whatever, like, 
no, there's none of that. It's going to be something else. And that's where I started. That's cool. Do you, do you think that you'd be able to, do you think you would have written this same book if you had waited a couple of years? Like it's so, it's so wild that we're now talking about this, thinking about like where four years ago when you were putting this pitch together and then it feels not like anything's over, but it feels like we all, I feel a little bit better. I don't want to speak for you, but like as over the past two weeks, I feel a little bit like I'm less like terrified every second. Um, so I'm curious, like, do you think it really was a product of like an exact moment or do you think you still would have like come up with something similar no matter, like was this always kind of there? Well, that's sort of like, my work will always be similar to my other work that has occurred when it when it's really like my work because it comes from me. So like I, I would mm -hmm. argue that yeah. Marcel Michel is sort of similar to my book that, that in some way or another, they come from the same um, the same soil, like the same land. But no, I don't I don't think I don't think I would write this book now because, first of all, a lot of the things that are in that book are personal issues that have in one way or another been kind of resolved um, mm -hmm. or they've changed and um, they're in a new they're in a new phase of their resolution or their existence and um, and I think that what I felt at the time was like oh man there's a really bad ex there's a really dangerous example of a male leader who is leading on on impulse alone and that impulse is not positive, good, or even um, like mentally sound. And I want to show an example of impulse that is positive mm. and that is considerate. And that comes from um, years of developing talent, voice, and, um, and a sense of responsibility towards other people without trying to um, become their leader or... Mm -hmm um coerce them into anything and so and I think I just was like really frantic for kindness towards mm -hmm. myself and in the world and while I saw more and more um pieces of ugliness kind of rapidly descending um I wanted to kind of like fling out pieces of beauty from myself as just like a sort of counter action so I just don't think I would have written this then. And I also think, you know, this is like really the first time I've ever tried to write a book. And there is something very, very, very special about a first effort. Yeah, um, that's true. You know, there's just like something there, whether it's like uh -huh. a first movie or like, you know, the, the first time you see like of someone who will become a superstar on screen yeah. or something like mm -hmm. their first movie or like this was when they were there and nobody had gotten in their head or in their way mm -hmm. of who they are what they, like should do what do you think do you think there are like major ways that this being your first book felt different from like other firsts you've had first movie stand-up things like that because it also is so so much of what you're doing for the first is completely solitary whereas like the other firsts are either like a group effort or just like in front of people yeah, I think I think your answer is in your question. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that it is it is a solitary effort, and um, I think it's it, at least important for me as a performer um, to be like, who are you really when nobody's looking? Like, who are you when you don't have that energy of presentation that helps you define who you are? Like, I would say I I like to be interviewed because the energy of not that I'm like faking anything, but there's like an imperative here that suddenly I can get like really clear. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm like yeah. this. Whereas when I'm kind of like floating through my day and there are like wafts of depression or doubt or heightened joy or whatever, like I just, I'm not synthesized in that way. But um, this was just something that in order to do it right, I had to be alone and I had to put myself totally first because when I would read things back to myself, I would know if my dignity had been compromised or if I was lying um, mm. or, you know, if I just, if I was like pushing it too much. Mm -hmm. um, 
so it was a real process of reckoning with myself. Um, and also like, usually I don't edit. Yeah. Like, that's really, like my thing is like, I go yeah, on stage totally. and it's not edit it and you mm -hmm. can't edit it. And even editing my Netflix special was very hard <laughs> because like, I tend to talk for a really long time and I, I don't repeat my jokes in the same way. So it was like really hard to edit. We had two shows, you know, so it was like really oh, right. and you're, together. Mm -hmm. And this was like, I learned how to edit and I learned how to throw, throw things away. Yeah. It's just really valuable. It's hard. Yeah. It's, it's really hard to do. I feel like, I think you, when we, um, when you did our cover for the fall books preview, you mentioned that you wrote the book like in a beach house and then you did the editing in a, it wasn't that it wasn't there, but it was another like kind of hold up in a house straight through editing process like what were each of those things like I feel like that's such a like if it's just such a idyllic image to me of like writing a book is it's like hold up in this like I got picture you as like um Diane Keaton and something's got to give like crying so chamber, hard but yeah. Yeah, the cry <laughs> <laughs> crying and typing. there was some crying there I mean like the pieces had been written slowly over like nine months, I would say. And then, you know, there's something kind of like cliche uh, and also like pressurized about going away to a house by the ocean to write a book. Mm -hmm. um, it's It actually worked really well for me. My parents had just, they were planning on selling and moving out of my childhood home and moving into this house that they built on Martha's Vineyard um, in Massachusetts. And the house didn't have any furniture in it aside from like some patio furniture brought inside and like mattresses, you know, for bed. Mm -hmm. And it had a television um, and internet and it just, but it was like super bare. Um, and I, I have a really hard time focusing. So while yeah. it is romantic that I was like there and I did try to pack well for it. And I really like tried to have focus in every little single way that I was there, but um, the pressure kind of fell away in terms of like, this is the time when I go to the house and I like write the thing. Um, yeah. and, and weirdly it started to pick up steam and I got into a really good rhythm. And, and of course now like wanting to write again, I'm so afraid that that will never come back. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and I feel totally differently. And the things I'm interested in are, are new and different and I don't know how to write about them. But at the yep, end yep. of this month by the sea, in which I was like, I arrived there being like, okay, like I'm now I'm really gonna go into being single and and not looking for a partner because I'm like, mm. I have no idea what I'm doing and I make really bad decisions, really bad decisions. So I I was like, well, that's what'll happen to me. And like halfway through the time there, I had my first visit from um the man who I'm now going to marry <laughs> and like I didn't you know like <laughs> I didn't expect that that would happen and I remember saying to one of my sisters like oh you know Ben came in and visited and he just visited we didn't like even kiss or anything we just like talked um and like kind of were like I you know like we had a feeling mm -hmm. about each other but, um but the timing had never worked out and and I, all I knew was like this man lives across the water where we now live actually um oh in, in Massachusetts in Massachusetts and cool. you can yeah. see the lighthouse from my parents house at, at our house where we live oh and like the great Gatsby it, yeah but less, happy. <laughs> less death of yes. so far. um and uh <laughs> and I think we're both cooler <laughs> than those absolutely parents. <laughs> sure you throw better parties too yeah but like I I was like I don't know all I know is that this person should like really be in my life but I was like I gotta finish my book and my older sister was like Jenny you've been there for two weeks like who's this guy what are you doing like don't focus on guys mm -hmm. you have to write do your work and I was sort of like that's right I do have to do my work and I remember thinking wow this is the first time in my life when when presented with romance or a creative output, I have put creative output just slightly ahead of romance. Mm -hmm. And that change was also really important to me because it also allowed me to like 
basically tell a bunch of other sort of problematic uh, relationships that had been occurring, like, you know what? How about we just like wave from afar forever because yeah. it, like doesn't mm -hmm. work and I, I gotta do something else. And mm -hmm. by the end of that month, I had turned a corner. I, I finished all the pieces and my father came uh, to the house and we spread them all out on the table. And he was like, this is the order I think they should be. And I was like, thank you. And my dad left. And then I was like, I'm going to make one stop. <laughs> and I went across the ocean to Ben's <laughs> house. And we have never, oh my God. <laughs> since then, we have literally not really been apart since then. Um, but I waited until the book was finished. And then uh, a couple months later, I went to my editor, uh, Jean's house. Jean is my editor from Little Brown. And mm -hmm. um, she had a new baby. And um, we read through every piece out loud and she helped me sort of like cut and organize again. And then on an airplane, I wrote the piece in the book called uh, Restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I wrote one more piece and we <laughs> shoved it in there and then it was done. <laughs> do, you think that, do you think that anything or could you even look back and tell that any part of the writing change like at that kind of like two week mark like did you feel like you were writing into your like I don't know if you were hopeful like you had that Ben had come or anything like that did that do you think it changed like the, any of the tone or your like kind of what you wanted to write about I don't think so I think like you know when you get like when you if your closet's a mess and you go in there and you like you just can't stop after a while. Like, like you're like, I'm going to yeah. close it down. I'm going to fold everything. It's about like what has been in there before with the hope yeah. that maybe mm -hmm. you'll, you'll go, you'll sort of call everything down and, and be kind of less encumbered when you walk out of there and you'll have like more control. And that's what I was doing. I was really like sorting through the past and trying to understand what, what are the main, what are my main pains? What are like mm -hmm. the main things that when that little string is plucked in me, I'm like, oh, you know, that's not, mm -hmm. that doesn't feel good for me anymore. And so I was really, really trying to just figure out what had happened before, because I think what I came to understand is I've never focused on, I've focused on getting attention and, and making sure that I seem acceptable sort of socially mm -hmm. or in my career, but mm -hmm. I've never focused on this voice that I write in, which is the voice mm -hmm. that I think in. And it just felt like I've got to sort through these last few years and, um, and then I can see it, you know, where I can go. Mm -hmm. but it was, um, yeah. Did you have any, like, were you looking for any one specific answer or were you just kind of hoping to like come out the other side of it with some sort of like, a, with a feeling or a freedom or like a clarity or was there like something that you were, what, did you have any, I'm not even, I mean, goals for like the end of the writing process, obviously you had to, you wanted to write the book, but like, did you feel like you, was there any kind of like question that you were looking to like really get to the bottom of yourself about? I think I was really looking, I mean, it's sort of cheesy to say, but I, I think I was really looking for freedom. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, I don't know, like sometimes I can think of myself as such a, you know, like I'm so self-concerned. Am I okay? Is this okay? Am I, am I, Am I making an issue, a problem, whatever? Um, like, what do I seem like? And I just didn't, I didn't wanna live with those questions anymore. I wanted to understand those answers for myself, but to stop asking those questions, which I just felt were so, um, they were like really, really holding me back and keeping me as a certain type of person, like pretty mm -hmm. limited. So I felt like I just wanna end up with a book that that does make people feel good. It's really imperative to me that my work that I create like makes people feel good in the same way mm -hmm. that a chef wants their food to taste good. Like the weird chefs are the ones that like their food looks beautiful, but you're like, 
Like, how do I eat this like twig with like foam? Yeah. You know, like <laughs> I was gonna say foam. Yeah, All this foam. foam. You know, like, and I'd probably bring that up because we've been we've been watching chefs table. Um, and like, there was, there's just like one chef that's like, you know, like curdled pig brain with colostrum or something. And you're just like, that's crazy. Um, <laughs> like you did it, but why? Um, so I, think <laughs> I really like, I wanted it to be something that other people could read and be like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like that. Or, oh, like, like just how when you see something in nature and you like are reminded that the world itself is a miracle. Like I just wanted people to feel alive. And, mm -hmm. um, and I wanted the book to just show me myself as I know myself and then like to feel free because of that. And I, and I do think it did that for me. Yeah. You, yeah. you were able to do like a full, I guess, cause this was a year ago. So you got the full like book tour experience. Yeah. Um, and I imagine you were probably talked to me like signings and talking to readers and things like that. I'm one, I'm curious if there's any like parts of the book passages, themes, et cetera, that felt like the most that elicited the most either like reaction or feedback or like things that people really wanted to talk about or like that hit them the hardest stuff like that. If there's anything that like, like it stood out as connecting with people. Well, you, what I did on my tour was like, I, I played theaters of about like 1100 mm. people. And I had in each city up um, a harpist that I met <laughs> through Twitter and cool. like they would play as I would read the pieces. So we would have like oh, this wow. like weird kind of funny, fancy evening. And, and the last piece I used to read um, is the piece called Blue Hour, which is one of the final pieces in the book. And it's it's really about um, kind of getting your shit together. That's what that mm -hmm. piece is about. Um, and it's, it's, it's about um, my own process of, of understanding that um, really factually, there's no time where you're waiting to be alive, that like you always are. And mm -hmm. that includes the really, really hard times when you're alone. So like, what, what can you find there? And people, did seem to want to talk about that. And they seem to mm -hmm. want to talk about um, how one might, like I always, every show, every reading got questions about like dealing with anxiety mm -hmm. um, and dealing with self-doubt. And, um, and I never, I never really like knew how to answer those questions, to be honest. Like I know how to answer them for me. But it was really, really nice to talk to people about it um, and like to just see how many people are are truly asking themselves the same question. And I'm asking it too, which is just like, mm -hmm. how do I find peace? Like, how do I, how do I exist so that this thing that does continually visit me is not just like a really numbing repetition of feeling bad? The weirdest question that Ben, that my fiance and I always talk about is like, people would ask, like, how, how do you find the courage to be vulnerable? I, I understand the question, but mm -hmm. my answer was always like, I don't think I'm any more or less vulnerable than anyone else. Um, mm -hmm. I just think I've decided that it feels better to let it out rather than keep it in and that we live yeah, in. A there's culture, nothing you know? in here that's like shocking or different no. than like, you know what I mean? There's nothing like, oh my God, she, she experienced that or she thinks that it's all, yeah. that's the whole point is everything. I was like, like the first, I think I like took a picture of like one of the first sentences in there. I was like, here we go. We're off. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not like, and the other thing is like the book is called little weirds because that is a, it's lifted from a part of that uh, piece called Blue Hour in which I sort of instruct myself to, to protect myself and all of the, the, little, the little special things, the little weirds that make me who I am. But the pieces themselves, even though some of them have like, you know, they work with magical realism or whatever, like mm -hmm. they're not weird. And I'm not like mm -hmm. weird, you know? Yeah. <laughs> in fact, like, I can't remember if it's in my stand-up special, but 
I use, I have a joke about like people who define themselves as weird that they're probably not, you know, like yeah. if you need to mm-hmm. say it, you're probably not. Um, yeah. And, and that was like kind of a risk in, in naming the book Little Weirds that people like, I remember there was like one reviewer who he, maybe she didn't even read the whole book. I'm like still kind of confused about it, but, but she was like, this book isn't weird enough. And it was like, I never, okay. I never yeah. said it was weird. <laughs> When I did want to ask, because you mentioned like, you know, some of it, some of the book is more literal than other parts. Do you feel, was your childhood home actually haunted? Was that a double metaphor or just a a one layered metaphor? Just a one layered metaphor that there were ghosts, (laughs) there were ghosts in there, but I'm the only one in my family who has, I'm the only one that didn't see them. Oh, so, so everybody saw them except okay. for me. everyone so saw them. Say that. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I know, weird. but I was like the most afraid of them. And it, and that's a funny lesson in like how just like anticipation is so scary. There's so much anticipation and feeling like you're going to open a door and there's going to be something horrible there. But I'm actually the only one. Like, I feel like I sensed them the most. But in terms of like seeing a lady float up mm-hmm. into the hallway lamp, that's like, that happened to my sister and my mom. I wanted to ask you too, like now that you're on the other side of like writing the book, releasing the book, and also like having gone through like the hardships that you were writing about, do you look back and feel, still feel like they're as hard or as upsetting as they were when you were writing? Or do you feel like, you're glad that they happened. Like, I feel like a lot of times too, especially in reading like things like this, like I have a a tendency to like over romanticize like heartbreak or melancholy for like art's sake. Um, And I feel like that's something that you could point to this book as being like a reason why you should do that because it gets you good art. Um, But I'm just curious like whether, what your kind of like feeling or perspective on it is now that you're like on this other side of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to feel like your brain, your personality, your sense of style and your preferences are what will get you whatever you think is good or not good art. Um, and for me, when I think about the t- those times, I'm like, I'm like really glad I'm not in them. In fact, yeah. I, I described it to my therapist <laughs> the, uh, yesterday as like, when I think about those times, the feeling that I have is that I'm watching an eight-year-old stand outside of her school and real, and she's like wondering if someone's going to pick her up. And I'm just like, oh my God, you know, like I, I the feeling I have a, about myself um, in my, in my early thirties and uh, up until about like the period of like being like 32 to 36 was one of the most important and difficult and impaired, like, like absolutely had to happen times in my life. So I'm glad those things happened. Um, I regret some of the pain that occurred mm-hmm. yeah. um, or damage that I caused by being like damaged to myself or time that I wasted um, by being like reckless or <laughs> drunk. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but that's, it sucks that the doorway that I went through in order to be like here in a safe, sunny life, that the doorway was like really smoggy and cobwebby mm-hmm. and scary and gross. Um, and gross is like a big word for me when I kind of think about it, but it had to happen. Mm-hmm. It had to happen, but um, but I don't romanticize it at all. I like- yeah. I, I, I often have like recurring dreams that I am back in the mind state or the life or whatever that I was in previously. And, um, everything feels so real to me in the dreams Mm -hmm. and towards the end of the dream, it always happens that I'm like, oh no, no, no. But I have like this life now. And I, I know these things and I'm like, really, I'm really different. And I, I have this immense feeling of relief. Um, yeah, so I don't, <laughs> I don't think I'm looking back and being like, ah, <laughs> remember when I was like addicted to cigarettes? <laughs> do you, did you have a, do you think you had an easy or hard like twenties? Cause I feel like for like 
when I think, I mean, I'm also still, I'm 33. So maybe I'm like, maybe in four years, I'll look back right now and be like, have those same feelings. But I have what you just described for like a lot of like early twenties and things where I look back and like, I have like kind of like a icky feeling in my stomach and, you know, so I like feel like sad. Did, do you feel like you had a good, like, did most of that for you happen during that period? Or did you also have the same like twenties issues that the rest of us had? I think I had the same twenties issues that everyone had. I, I had a really fun time. I, you know, I was heavy into stand up. So mm. I, I did stand up four or five nights a week and that was my whole life. And I was in, I lived in Brooklyn and, um, you know, what is a little bit romantic about that was like, I didn't get my first job until I was like 27. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I graduated college, I, I guess, like, how old are you when you graduate? Like 22? 22. Um, and those five years seemed like torture to me. Um, mm -hmm. they, they, they felt exactly like what it feels like when you, ha you have a crazy unrequited love. And you're just like, I would live in a different world if that person were my partner. You know, like I, every, it would be, it would be magic. And so I was sad a lot of the times because I wasn't an actor and I couldn't, I had no idea how to get a job or get an agent. Um, I just wanted it so bad, like just so hungry for the, for the work and the chance. And, um, and I also like, yeah, I just like made a lot of mistakes and had a lot of like weird boyfriends and, you know, a, a lot of like drama maybe, but um, I look back on that and I'm like, yeah, no, that was like, that was right. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I guess that's, yeah, that's true too. Like I, the unrequited love thing is such a good way to describe like those first couple of years, like out of college, like when I graduated and like moved to New York and that was, I was like, if I don't work at Vogue magazine, I, like not everything will be yeah. horrible. And like, I would just like, look at like other people who did all day long like in my room in Park Slope and yeah cry a lot of like what they call compare and despair uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> in my 20s and um I really was so down on myself on, on how I looked and you know had bad bad feelings about my my worth um that I I'm so happy to see those like those aren't there anymore but mm -hmm. uh not like, I mean, I have different self-worth issues now at 38, but they didn't like just go away. They're just different. But, um, but I, I think that time really built, you know, that's where I made all of my comedian friends and where I really got confident at comedy and yeah, crucial time. It, it is weird. Like, um, I think that when I, the period of, of my life that's like that goes from like 32 to like just around 35 or 36 um, was the time when I was like, oh, everything I thought about myself, like I've been pretty one sided. I have like I have more investigation to do. I don't think I exactly understand how I'm coming off. And I've set a bunch of rules in place in order to make myself feel secure, but a lot of them are not good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, also in your, I wrote down, I'm like looking through like things that I scribbled down in the margin when I was reading and I wrote down Aries question mark, exclamation point, question mark, exclamation point. Cause I took for the first like half of this book, I was like, this is a Pisces. This woman is a Pisces. Um, I'm on the cusp. <laughs> you are on the cusp. That is true. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm curious what you're like, what part of the like Aries-esque do you feel like fits fits you? Obviously you're very like accomplished which I think is an Aries thing, but. Um, sorry, I'm like, I'm like motioning to my uh, fiance <laughs> to not slam the door. I'm like, yeah. um, <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting that you ask that because I'm, so I am an Aries. If, if you know anything about astrology, I'm an Aries, but I have cancer rising. So oh, oh okay. I'm like a double, I'm an Aries sun and moon. And um my rising sign is cancer, and everything is in the 10th house, oh, wow. which is 
the house of like career and fame. And I'm just like, I'm really like one thing, but, um, you know, I, I, there's a piece in this book. Um, I think that it's just called, I was born. There's a bunch of mm-hmm. things called, yeah, I was, I, was born. Born. I think yeah. this is like, the, I was born. It's about being born in the springtime. Yeah. And yeah. The flowers. I, yeah. I recently got a reading by the astrologer Chani Nicholas, who I uh, just like, I love her so much. And she was like, oh, you were born moments after a new moon. So every everything about you is this like energy of like, I'm going to meet it. I'm going to get there. I'm like pushing, I'm pushing, I'm pushing. And it is really hot. And that is, I am Aries, very Aries in that way. Um, yeah. And and you know and like that i feel i feel like mars like turmoil you know mm-hmm. um but as i get older and i don't want to sustain any more emotional injury <laughs> i find different ways to be that kind of like hot-blooded warrior mm, that makes sense um the astrologist that i go to always tells me that like to counteract it's interesting that you have the same you said sun and moon are both Aries um but like to counteract kind of the negative pulls of your moon sign the best thing is to act more like your rising sign yeah is the the best um thing but yeah are you an Aries too so I'm a Pisces Pisces right right. Pisces Leo rising and a Taurus moon um which is yeah that's the the toughie (laughs) It's all, there's nothing that isn't tough. And there's also nothing that is like a huge opportunity, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, one of the things actually that happened to me since I wrote this book is that I was like, it's really annoying that I am not, that I don't really have a religion. Like culturally, I'm very Jewish and like, you know, whatever you want to say about how in my look, I understand that I, uh, present as perhaps I am Jewish, um, <laughs> which is like neither here nor there, but whatever. Um, would I, could I be in a movie about Jewish people? Yes, I think I sure. could yeah. because I am. Mm-hmm. Um, but <laughs> and I still to this day think about what is that movie about like a bunch of Jewish people at a funeral and like they're all good actors. It's like Jane Fonda. Oh, this is where I leave you. Right. And I just remember being like, they're what? sitting Shiva. Yeah, like these people like, are not did, did taking shit. Yeah, like they are maybe taking communion. Like this is weird. <laughs> like I was mm-hmm. just like, isn't Dax yeah. Shepherd in that? He's Dax Shepherd. <laughs> yeah, and like love him, but he's not Jewish. He's not Jewish. He's wonderful. Put Dax Shepherd in every movie. I truly like Same. just <laughs> so enjoy him in every way. Um, but I I remember auditioning for that movie, but for the Rose Byrne part, like not even for the <laughs> Jewish part. Like, it just I was like, this is this is. This is weird. This is a thing that I'm just like not sure of. Um, But but anyway, I remember being like, oh man, it's so weird that I don't really have like a faith. And, um, and that, and, and so I've started to read, um, like listen to interviews with Buddhist scholars and started to read Buddhist texts and like eventually started going to the temple here in, in my neighborhood in Los Angeles and like actually you know, easing myself into a Buddhist practice. And like, one of the things that has helped me the most is this feeling of like, yeah, like everything is gonna change. It's gonna be bad, it's going to be good, but what's going to cause your suffering is if you're like gripping and is if you're mm. like like trying to control that, that change. And um, I tend to approach my astrology in the same way where I'm like, you know, like there's a way that you can tell someone that like that they're, they're a double Aries and they're just like a nightmare, like they're crazy. <laughs> and I, I can't, I can't have that. Yeah, that's true. I do have a friend who's a triple Scorpio and I know that she, that is, she is the one, um, she'll be the first one to say like, that is a, a tough deck of cards to be dealt astro- astrologically speaking. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm curious. So are you planning, are you writing more right now like what are you and like are you able to especially in with everything that's going on i, I hate that for like i'm so sick of saying like with everything that's going on in the it's world so funny right how now. it's really caught on 
in these times, I like I need Everything to think of a new way on. to yeah. <laughs> I need to think of a new way to phrase it. I still haven't opened like I'm not opening my emails. Like, hope you're handling. You know, I'm, I'm ignoring it in emails, which I think is helping. Um, yeah. But anyways, are, with being at home all the time, are you able to like? How are you finding your like creative? But like where, what's kind of like your outlet right now? I am trying not successfully, but I guess I am to write. Um, and I just like, at this point when I have an idea and I'm like, oh, I get out my phone and I like put it in the notes app and then I email mm -hmm. it to myself. And oftentimes I see like, I don't try to, I don't want to write anything long. I actually just really don't. And it's easier for me if something ends up being long, it's easier for me to think like, I'm just trying to write a half a page here. Like this thing's just half a page. Um, and then I email it to myself and I look and I'm like, oh, this is actually, this is like a substantial um, three quarter formed thought. Um, and I'm trying, but I, I don't, I just don't feel, I feel like very foggy mm -hmm. and I feel really blasted, I'm sure like most people do, by um, the like just major revelations of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I just don't, I don't like feel very capable of output, but I don't wanna be totally disconnected from the, the thinker self that I am. And so the, what I'm doing is like, I, I read a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I read a lot and I, I make a list of the books I've read. And, um, I think in 2020, I'm like, I'm just hitting my, my 30th book. Oh, that's wow. Yeah. So I read that's a lot. Fun. Yeah. And, um, I'm just kind of like, I guess my whole deal is intake right now. <laughs> this has been a really different year for me because I usually just read mostly fiction um, and I don't tend to read a lot of short stories. I tend to read novels like other than mm. like, I, like I'll read any George Saunders, you know, um, like, but for the most part, I usually don't read short stories. I like, like, like one, thing. But this year there was a lot of, there was a feeling that I had, especially in the spring of like, whoa, I have some major catching up to do. Mm -hmm. And um, so I found myself reading um, Angela Davis. I read Freedom, Freedom is a Constant Struggle. Um, I read some Martin Luther King sermons. And then I would like totally switch gears and um, read like I, I read uh, Marilyn Robinson. Um, I read Gilead this summer. I, and I also mm, I love this year, have read Home and Homecoming and Gilead and I have her new book now. Oh, um, good. Okay, yeah. So good. And, then, and then like, I was like, maybe I'll just read some nonfiction. Um, I've gotten very into the idea of um, psilocybic therapies, like LSD therapy, mm -hmm. mushroom therapies. And so I've been reading the Michael Pollan book called How to Change Your Mind. My boyfriend has been reading that for the past like three months and talking about it every single day. Yeah, it's, it's I need to read it. really great, really, really great. Um, and, and then um, I've been reading a lot of the work of um, Tova Janssen, um, who is a, um, uh, a Finnish writer. Oh, cool. Um, she's, she's dead now, but um, she, she was the author of the Moomin Trolls, which is like a, they're characters for kids, but I think her most oh. famous novel is called The Summer Book. Um, but I've just like, yeah, gotten really into her stuff. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of what else. And like, and then I also like, re, you know, this summer I like reread East of Eden. So I was like, mm. Oh, I remember loving this book in, you know, like ninth grade. And then I read it again and I was like, sorry. <laughs> I know. I know <laughs> like I've lost my stomach for some of the classics. Thing. Not that you're like, I don't know. Like I get why age. they, yeah. Like that you, they give it to ninth graders so that you can learn like about symbolism or allegory, mm -hmm. you know, or archetypes or whatever. But I just, I was reading it and I was like, well, this is a little heavy handed. <laughs> 
And it's just like a white man in the past being like, this woman was a tricky whore and she fooled all of them with her vagina, you know? And you're just like, this is okay. Um, I should remind everyone watching that your book, Little Weirds, is the paperback is on stands now. Or if you really fancy a hard copy, you can get a hard cover as well if you want to. If you fancy one. Yeah. If you fancy one. I prefer the hard copies personally. Um, mm. But thank you so much for chatting with me. Um, thank you.